previously in the complete creation. This is a complete falsification of major predictions of evolution. Evolution would dictate no footprints or skeletons being found in rocks that old. Welcome back and thank you for joining me again in this exhaustive series. We're now past the halfway mark in this epic adventure as we explore the science, philosophy, and theologies of the creation evolution debate. We've been continuing to explore the fossil and rock record and spent the last couple of lectures looking at the geology of the rock record as it pertains to things like fossil footprints in deserts. Now, shortly, we'll take a look at these, all of these easily falsified ages assigned to those rock layers. Now, those ages were literally made up based on the evolution myth and what can only be described as wishful thinking. Then, when the myriad of dating methods came along, they were forced to fit these assigned ages. When you look at the actual history of how those ages were assigned, where those numbers actually came from, you can see that they are literally nothing more than unsupported guesses that have become dogma. We'll use evidence from the dinosaurs over and over again to demonstrate this fact and to show this history. Uh, for example, the assigned ages have changed over time, getting older and older. This can be seen in the popular press. For example, in 1905, T-Rex was alleged to be 8 million years old. But T-Rex must have aged in dog years or something, because by 1927, he was 30 million years old. By the time 1941 had rolled around, he was allegedly 100 million years old. Study of the dinosaurs provides stunning evidence that all of these ages are completely and wholeheartedly false. They are fiction. We'll even use some of the evolutionary dating methods on dinosaur fossils and dinosaur bearing layers to show the conflict between the scientific evidence and the wishful thinking of deep time. But before we get to that, I'd like to address one more topic that deep time advocates routinely bring up regarding the dinosaurs, that of fossil dinosaur egg nests. Now, this is an actual fossil dinosaur egg from a hadrosaur, one of the duck-billed dinosaurs. I have a cast here of a juvenile dinosaur, a juvenile duck-billed dinosaur skull here from Joe Taylor at the Mount Blanco Fossil Museum in Texas. Dinosaur eggs are relatively common. I myself have had the privilege of seeing at least hundreds of them. Uh, but when I'm giving a lecture with kids and I pass around this fossil dinosaur egg, those kids are always quick to ask one question. Is there a baby dinosaur in there? Now that is an excellent question to which I can definitively say no. Why? Because the moment a dinosaur egg is excavated, it is immediately run through x-ray imaging to find out if there is a baby dinosaur in there. They do this because while dinosaur eggs are fairly common, finding one with a dinosaur embryo is exceedingly rare, and the value of the dinosaur egg goes through the roof if it's found to have an embryo inside of it. But that's a significant data point in the investigation. Why on earth 
would dinosaur embryos be so rare, especially if the eggs themselves are fairly common? Hmm. But let's take a look at dinosaur egg nests because the advocates of deep time wish to contend that delicate nests of dinosaur eggs would never survive a global flood. Now, I beg to differ, and I invite you to conduct your own research, both you, the advocates of deep time, and those of you viewers who astutely wish to verify or refute what I am saying here. Now, this is a reconstruction of a nest of eggs from an oviraptor dinosaur on display at the Big Valley Creation Science Museum, just north of the Dinosaur Bearing Badlands in Alberta, Canada. Do stop in if you get the chance. Uh, several things to note about these nests. Notice that the eggs were laid in pairs. Now, it's not clear whether the dinosaur had two oviducts or what, but apparently there were several dinosaurs which laid eggs two at a time. The mother dinosaur would apparently sit in the middle, lay two eggs, rotate, lay another two eggs, rotate, lay another two, and continue to make a circle. Now, it will sometimes lay a second layer of eggs in a circle on top of the first. Now, this makes a whole pile of sense, actually, as then the mother dinosaur can sit in the center to brood and not crush the eggs. This dinosaur was smart. Oh, but wait. Is this a clue in the debate over whether the dinosaurs were cold-blooded or warm-blooded? I would venture it is a significant clue. Why would the mother brood over the eggs instead of just digging a hole and burying the eggs like a cold-blooded turtle does? Now, while this particular nest was attributed to Oviraptor, it appears many, if not all, of the egg-laying dinosaurs wanted to nest this way. So here's a reconstruction of an unknown dinosaur egg nest from China, clearly depicting that telltale circular pattern. And over in France, you can see some sauropod eggs laid in circular patterns of eggs intermixed with clusters of eggs. It would appear that the dinosaurs instinctively wanted to lay their eggs in a circle, but something interfered with their nesting. I wonder what it was that interfered with their nesting. By the way, I highly recommend you read Walter Barnhart's exceptional paper in the Creation Research Society Quarterly. I will be referencing that paper heavily in this segment as it is so well done. And that paper uh, inspired the multiple egg nest reconstructions I made for several creation museums around North America. But we do find some orderly dinosaur nests in sedimentary layers that we creationists would claim were laid down by the flood of Noah. Now, deep time advocates argue that preserved egg nests would refute the idea that these layers were laid down by Noah's flood. After all, how on earth did the nest survive undisturbed while catastrophic flash floods swept over it? Now, it's an excellent question, but I contend that in actuality, the evidence profoundly supports a flood burial. In further flume studies that we conducted at the Creation Evidence Museum, we built a larger linear flume fed by the rotary flume, which kept the sediment suspended in a large volume of water, which we could then wash through the flume at speeds of up to three meters per second, which is roughly the speed of the tsunami floodwaters on the land in Indonesia in 2004, and Japan in 2011. So here's some research that those of you who are ambitious can do. To address the questions 
surrounding nests in flood waters. I took some chicken eggs, which when fresh are just negatively buoyant. I laid them in sand in the flume in different orientations to the flow and then opened the gate to start the sediment laden waters flowing through at about two meters per second. Not only did the eggs not budge, the water flowing around the eggs changed velocity. Now, I didn't discuss uh, previously the effects of these changes, but such flows are very visible in the cross sections of cliffs with polystrate fossils. Take a look at this polystrate trunk from Tennessee. The water was flowing right to left, and you can see prominent cross beds in the sediments, but also the water was flowing around the tree. So the water splits on this side to go around the trunk. Now it's a Venturi effect, which means the water velocity will increase here where the flowing water has to split. Higher water velocity means that it can carry more sediments and larger sand grains. So you can see that the water scoured the sediments on this side of the trunk, visible as a thinning of the sedimentary layer. But on this side, where the water flows come back together, the water velocity drops. Slower water means it can't carry as much sediments, nor can it carry larger grains of the sediments. So the sediments fall out of suspension from the water flow, leading to a thickening of the layers, the sedimentary layers. These are what Calder et al. called vegetation-induced sedimentary structures in the title of their paper on the Joggins Fossil Cliffs. They are visible all over the place at Joggins and shows that it was massive amounts of flowing waters that buried the numerous polystrate plants. Now, what we saw in our research with our nest of chicken eggs in sand was the exact same effect. The water velocity increased here, scouring sediments on the upstream side of the eggs and depositing those sediments on the downstream side. This actually buttressed the eggs and further kept them from being moved by any flowing water, which was now also depositing sediments on the nest, burying the eggs exactly how and where I placed them. So by experimentation that you can conduct at home, if you build a flume, you can verify for yourself that yes, most certainly a ground laid egg nest can be buried in place by even an extremely powerful flash flood like a tidal wave from a tsunami. Now, let's come back to the dinosaur embryos. As I said, I've personally seen at least hundreds of dinosaur eggs, yet I can only think of one dinosaur embryo in an egg that I've seen. So just going by those numbers alone, Obviously, the numbers of dinosaur eggs containing embryos would be less than 1%, a, a very small number. This is a significant point for a few reasons, and the first has to do with the question of why are there so few embryos found? Well, it's simple, really. There's been no incubation time. The eggs were quickly buried by a flood shortly after they were laid, killing any embryonic development. Now, the second point is how difficult it is to identify the dinosaur that laid the eggs. If there's no embryo there, and body fossils of the dinosaurs are also rarely found with the eggs, then identification of the mother, mother dinosaur is, at absolute best, a guess. And that's okay, nothing wrong with a guess, but let's just be sure to call it what it is. It is a guess. The lack of identification does cause issues, but they can be fun ones. Uh, for example, the oviraptor was so named because a skeleton of an oviraptor was found with some eggs. 
and so it was assumed that the oviraptor was stealing the eggs for food. Ova for egg, raptor for thief. It was named the egg thief, oviraptor. Later on, similar eggs were found which did have embryos inside. Guess which kind of dinosaur it was? You guessed it, the oviraptor. So evidently it wasn't stealing the eggs, but it got buried alongside its eggs. But get a load of this. There has now been a few incredible findings of oviraptor dinosaurs, not just buried in association with their eggs, but buried alive while brooding on the nest. Here's one from the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, everything is there except for the head of the dinosaur. Uh, here's the neck, here's the body. Uh, you can see it had its arms over the eggs. Evidently trying to protect them from something and you can see two layers of eggs laid in a circle underneath it. This dinosaur was nicknamed Big Mama, and here's another, which was nicknamed Big Auntie, or Big Auntie, depending on where you're from. <laughs> here's the circular nest of eggs, the legs, the arms. Here's the neck exhibiting that classic epistatonic pose. Here's a third example of an oviraptor, buried alive while sitting on its nest of eggs, its legs, the arms, the upper body was lost, but take a close look at the eggs. You can see fossil embryos in some of them. This find is especially stunning because finding embryos is exceedingly rare. Finding the mother dinosaur in association with the eggs is exceedingly rare, but finding both is astonishing. Now in that paper, the researchers noted that not all the eggs had embryos and the ones that did have embryos were in different stages of development, what they called asynchronous hatching. That is, the eggs developed at different rates and hatched at different times. Now they admit they could not explain this. However, as Barnhart mentions in his CRSQ paper, if the mother is carrying the eggs for an excessive amount of time, the fertilized eggs will develop inside the mother. Now it is difficult to know what effects this might have. Asynchronous development of the embryos may very well be the result. And you need to understand, all of these dinosaur egg nests are found in layers that even the evolutionary researchers call tidal flats. The sediments even contain marine fossils, and it's obvious that these oviraptors were buried by a flash flood. On this, everybody agrees. In fact, Lopez Martinez et al., publishing in the Journal of Paleogeography, Paleoclimatology and Paleoecology entitled their 2000 article, Dinosaurs Nesting on Tidal Flats. In that paper, they described the egg nests. The clutch occurs in gray marls that were originally waterlogged, muddy sediments. Question. When the evidence heavily favors the dinosaurs being warm-blooded and them wanting to lay their eggs in circles so they can brood the eggs, why would they lay them in disorganized clusters in waterlogged muddy sediments? May I suggest to you it's because there was no other place to lay the eggs and the dinosaurs weren't laying nests 
but rather getting rid of the eggs in high stress conditions. Namely, a global flood that had been encroaching upon the land higher and higher over several weeks. The tidal flats the authors were referring to was the Trent Formation in Spain. But the point I'm making here is that all of these alleged dinosaur egg nests that were claimed to be a problem for us catastrophists who are claiming that these layers were laid down by a flood, yet all of these eggs are found in layers claimed by the evolutionists to be flood plains. Now, the popular press likes to depict the oviraptors buried on their nests as nesting in a riverbed, which is downright deceptive in their description, because if you look at the actual evidence, it's not a riverbed, it's a tidal flat. So this is what the scene would look like. And remember, this tidal flat is provincial in size. It would literally be farther than the eye can see in all directions. Then a flash flood rushed in, burying the oviraptors alive while sitting on their nests. This is what the evidence shows. Does that line up with the story of a local flash flood overflowing the riverbanks? Or does this further affirm the global flood narrative where, between resonant tidal waves, the oviraptors laden with eggs they've probably been carrying for quite some time at this point, made a nest in just a few short hours in the only spot they could, the tidal flats that were freshly laid down by the last tidal waves. They didn't want to do this. They had to do this. When you gotta go, you gotta go. <laughs> so, what the dinosaurs apparently wanted to do instinctively was to lay circles of eggs in a nest. Yet, they were under stress, carrying around eggs for days to weeks before they finally laid them. Some of them died on their nests. Others apparently laid their eggs while they were on the move. This was a group of eggs found in the Two Medicine Formation of Montana and originally attributed, attributed to the Truodon dinosaur. However, as is typical, no eggs were found with embryos, nor body fossils of the mother, so the identity of the egg layer is only a guess. Now, I did misspeak about this particular group of eggs many years ago and referred to them as oviraptor eggs. I was talking about oviraptor eggs, and these eggs were virtually identical to oviraptor eggs. The hate-filled atheists mocked me for not only getting the wrong dinosaur, but getting the wrong continent, as oviraptor wasn't even found in North America. What a ridiculous argument. Do you guys honestly not realize how foolish this makes you look? Because your identification of the egg-laying dinosaur is a guess! But wait for it. Lo and behold, just a couple of years later, oviraptor dinosaurs were found in North America. Where? In Montana. Gee, that's where these eggs were found. At any rate, while the hate-filled atheists were trying to distract away from my points with their irrational and ridiculous mocking over my not using their favorite guess words, <laughs> They didn't even raise a finger to answer the point I was making. These eggs were not laid in a circular nest. They were simply dropped in place while the dinosaur was under stress. I would suggest that dinosaur was on the move, probably running from the next incoming tidal wave. Seeing as how the layer below the eggs was a tidal flat, of provincial size, and the layer of sediments that buried the eggs was a tidal flat of provincial size. But check it out. The titanosaur clusters of eggs found in Spain were also found in what appeared to be bunches of hurriedly dropped eggs, and they were dropped 
in disorganized bunches in a relative line, as the dinosaur was apparently on the move. This reconstruction shows approximately the way the eggs were found. Those dinosaurs weren't sticking around to take the time to make nice circular nests that they wanted to make. Why not? Now here's another clutch of eggs called a, a nest, of which bon Bernhardt made a very astute observation. The mother dinosaur apparently followed the instinctive habit of standing in one spot and laying a circle of eggs. But notice something weird. The eggs were apparently laid in rising mud. This had to have been the first egg laid, and each egg is higher than the last. Remembering that these sedimentary layers are provincially sized tidal flats, it would appear that mud was being deposited around the ankles of the dinosaur as it laid its eggs. The fossil evidence could hardly be called a challenge to flood catastrophists. It is clear that this was less than ideal conditions for the laying of eggs and that the evidence, if anything, supports a global watery catastrophe and not long and slow geological processes in deep time. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. Wait, did he just admit that if the rocks being dated were only 6,000 years old, that the radio dating methods would give an erroneous inflated age of millions of years? Yes. Yes, he did. Why, thank you for that concession. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's Video On Demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support. Mm -hmm.